Lord, we thank you for our uh, opportunity, our freedom that we do not want to take for granted of meeting together so we can discuss your truth, your word, your revelation, and not only hear it, but also uh, pray for the grace of reception, of a spirit of desire to know you better, and the grace of holy aspiration uh, to, uh, that we would see you more clearly and so understand you and uh, relate, relate to you in a richer and more profound way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm taking a little kind of uh, in-betweener because I just finished a little series on um, about is, is there really a God? And then last Sunday, I did a kind of what they would call a one-off. And this one-off was where I did the what about evolution? And so I would commend that for you if you're interested. I don't know if it's been posted yet on the uh, Kenboa.org website, but we, we all these, just to let you know, the week, these, these weekly studies go up. And so this is what I, what I teach here, you see? So you can actually go here, and so I can, here's the, uh, the contingency of the cosmos. Is there really a God? You see that? And then you could actually uh, see, the, see the video, and there's a whole, there's a, and this shows you what the series is, you see? So you can always go back to that. I don't think that we have yet the um, one on evolution, but it's a good standalone, and I would recommend that for you to show or, or, or give to anyone who's a student especially a high school student or a college student, because most people haven't really been exposed to these kinds of arguments. They're solid, and they just speak for themselves. And I'm using pure science to do it. I'm not looking at anything else but science. And so inference to the best explanation always reveals that, that uh, we're looking at something that's beyond anything that the neo-Darwinian synthesis can possibly offer. So we're going, we're, I'm going to take a little break now for just a moment and do a one-off teaching of a book that uh, we've just completed. We had to revise it for InterVarsity Press. And, um, it's called Recalibrate Your Life, Navigating Transitions with Purpose and Hope. And this is not merely for uh, people who are thinking of retirement, but actually it's to create a way of life, a way of living, so that you assess and review your life on an ongoing basis, whether you're young or old. The earlier you do this, the better off you are. But it's never too late. That's the interesting thing. Even so, the best is yet to come. So we take us and we move from where we are to where God would have us to be. So Jenny and I worked on this book together. And I'm going to just give you a kind of an overview of this. And sometime I might do a, talk you through it when the book is printed, uh, published. But, uh, uh, but there are three components. One is perspective. And so the question you always want to ask yourself is about what gives meaning to life. And this, as you can see, includes uh, chapters like leaving a godly legacy. And we all want to be able to do that, don't we? It's, the whole thing is an intergenerational connection with other lives. So that your life really is more than just your own. It's a matrix of other lives that are involved. And so you are a transgenerational influencer, but you receive and you respond and then you, you pass it on. And one of the other chapters is very critical. You're not going to have a proper perspective unless you number your days and recognize the very brevity of this earthbound sojourn, how brief, how transitory, how, how ephemeral. And one of the exercises you might want to try is look at, just remember your 10-year markers. You can remember when you were 10 years old. And you can remember, now think about when you were 20, you see. And some of you can go further than that, of course, <laughs> and, uh, as I can. And um, my 30th year, I can remember, uh, uh, suddenly I can summon up those memories. What's interesting, though, is the memories when I was 30 are no more vivid than the ones when I was 10. There's a, there's a kind of a concurrence so that you can actually mysteriously look at the past and work your way through all past, present, and future, see them all as simultaneous, you see, because as you look back on your own, own life journey. So numbering your days and recognizing the brevity of the earthbound sojourn, I, I use this little, re, this little uh, material here. Um, I, it's, it's this idea, that if you looked at your life in terms of, let's suppose you were given, granted 80 years to, on this world, okay? As for our lives, 70, or if due to strength, 80, some of us are really pushing it. We're living on, we're on borrowed time to accomplish unfinished business. But if you imagine, though, if you consider then these years, and you just focus on, this is your, uh, 
your 10th year, and then you're 20 and 30, and suddenly, where did it all go? You're 40. And, so, and the, then the big zero years make a big difference, don't they? Uh, the big 5-0, I've hit the big 6-0, now I'm the 70, you see? How long do you know? I claim that if you only were given a, a kind of a, an 80 years of what God is promising to you, and if the, you truly believe that your life in this uh, realm here would affect this life here, we want to make everything, do everything you could do to make it happen. But I find that people don't live that way. They're so focused on what I'm going to do now, now my, 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 now my kids, my grandkids, and so forth, retirement, and so forth. They zoom into this so much. They live in this world so much that they hardly even think about that because it's an abstract thing that they suppose they can postpone. But that you, you, you have that mindset to your peril because you must be more and more transitioning and recognizing the brevity of the earthbound sojourn so that you live each day in the light of that day that's going to come. So here's the point, though. Even if it was 80 years, imagine 80 years where there's no pain, no sorrow, no death, no, no sin, no uh, grievance, no mourning. Imagine that. All the old things have passed away. All things have become new. Imagine where there's no world system that would impinge upon us that's been dealt with about there's no um the flesh has been dealt with at the judgment seat so now you can't even think sin because it's all been purged and purified and perfected imagine as well that years there's no the devil and his angels have no power any longer so the warfare is over just imagine those and now as add to that the idea of a resurrected body that's so beyond your capacity to imagine really your mind, your powers, even your capacity for pleasure, all these things will be vastly greater. And then you imagine as well, not only this vastly greater resurrected body that is actually ageless, which is a wonderful thing. You'll never age. And yet, I think, in, all, in some mysterious sense, you'll have all the ages in one. It's an interesting thought. And we will be able to recognize each other and have this great, ex extraordinary fellowship that's transcendent. And then imagine as well that the world, the cosmos, which waits for our resurrection, so it too can be resurrected from its slavery to corruption and futility to the freedom and the glory of the children of God. Imagine what that's going to be. If this fallen world is that impressive, what is the next going to be like? And then finally, you're going to be able to be a gardener of that new creation because you hear, have heard me say before, well, I like to describe heaven in one way as endless creative activity without frustration to the glory of God. That's a rather nice way of looking at it. Instead of the Gary Larson cartoon where the guy is floating in a cloud and he's got his, uh, he's got his harp and he's got his little wings and some weird, all, all nonsense. Uh, but he says, it's brilliant. I wish I'd bought a magazine. Because what do you do? Most people's idea of heaven is my idea of a crashing boar. You see, no, you're going to be creating and gardening and making wonderful things. I claim that would be enough to make all the difference. You'd want to go for broke for that. And yet here's the point that I make. That line continues, doesn't it? And so I kind of have a way of just emphasizing the line continues, the road continues on, and mysterious turns will take place. And so it just keeps on going. Do you realize what implications this has for you? because it tells us that you are going to be an eternal, woo, something's happening here. And so it moves up and something's happening here. And if you're a part of something, and it goes on and on forever. Now, in that camp contrast, look at your life. There it is. Your life is like a vapor. Let's live accordingly. Let's live with wisdom. Let's treasure the things that matter, treasuring God and people, because the currency of heaven is relationships. And so building and, and leveraging the things that are passing away uh, and to actually invest it in those two things that will endure, it's the word of God and people. And when you take your diminishing uh, capacities in this world, but we have all these resources that are temporary, your, uh, how much time you've been given, and then, as well, the uh, resources you've been granted and your capacities. And if you take those things that are passing away and leverage them, so it becomes the currency of heaven by building the truth into people who are eternal beings, that's not a bad way of living. 
You see, that's a good way of transforming, transforming and transferring that wealth. Moving from career to calling is another component we, we talk about in this book. And it has to do with not seeing that your job is your, is your, uh, your life, but rather being defined by your vocari, vocation. True vocation means calling. And so you may retire from a career, but you never retire from a calling. You still have a calling, and that's, that's true of all things. Then a better vision of retirement, because most people's idea of retirement isn't very, very good at all. And so that has to do with knowing, and then being is this next component, a purpose. What gives direction in life? And so having a sense of understanding and discovering uh, not only God's purpose, what's your unique purpose, and living into that purpose by the decisions that you make. So we have a couple of chapters in that. And then finally, the doing. Um, how do you invest your life in stewarding all that God gives, your time, talent, treasure, which is the usual things that are associated with stewardship, but I added these two, because they are, in my mind, just as much matters of stewardship as our time, talent, and treasure, namely truth. Because to whom much has been given, much will be required. So the more of the God's word you know, the more accountable you become. Well, one solution then is to stop reading the Bible. That's not a good solution. Um, but you will be accountable. So when he teaches you something, he then will test you in the teach-test principle. And he wants to immerse that and embed that in you. Because why would he give you more light if you don't respond to the light you've been given? So once you get that, and then he wants you to go on, so as you respond. And then stewarding relationships, so it's a matter of stewardship and living so that the best is yet to come. So I thought this morning it would be good before this, uh, I do a series uh, whenever this book comes out, it keeps getting delayed, and it now will probably be maybe the end of the year or first or next, we'll find out. But the first chapter is The Road Goes Ever On and On. How many of you are familiar with, familiar with The Hobbit, uh, The Lord of the Rings, have actually read them, or, some, or maybe you've seen the films, and you remember this is a song that, uh, that Bilbo sings, goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began, now far ahead the road is gone, and I must follow if I can, pursuing it with eager feet to, until it joins some larger way. There's a larger way your road's going to lead to. And if you think this is good, wait till you see what God's got in store for you. Where many paths and errands meet, and whither then, I cannot say. And that's Bilbo's song. And, it's, and then you see it recurring. Frodo uses it as well and picks, picks up elements from it. And as Bilbo puts it... Um, uh, Frodo says, Bilbo used often to say that there was only one road, that it was like a great river. Its springs were at every doorstep, and every path was its tributary. It's a dangerous business, Frodo, going out of your door, he used to say. You stop into the road, you step into the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you might be swept off to, which is exactly what happened to him on his adventures. Um, and so the idea even there is a cross-generational influence that uh, Tolkien is, uh, is exhibiting here, that one generation shapes and touches and affects the next, and you're part of that connectedness, that God does this until he brings all things together. In other words, you participate in one another's journeys in a very real way. And so our journeys are not solo, are they? Because pilgrim would not go by himself. It never was so that you, when you're in a pilgrimage, you do it by yourself. This is not something for the individual. This is a corporate, a communal uh, faith. So yes, we come to faith as individuals, don't we? But we grow, how? In community. You won't grow just by yourself. You need the body of, of other believers. So it's very, very ecclesial, the idea of the church, the community, the congregation. And, we're, uh, we're, and then participating in a bigger journey together. Whither then, we, I cannot say. So there are just some things that, um, the change, changing scenery. But one of the things I wanted to call to your attention are two kinds of experiences, those that are voluntary 
and those that are involuntary that will force you to refigure and recalibrate and revisit. Our voluntary experiences, for example, graduating from college, getting married, moving, starting a new job, having a child, quitting your job to stay home with your kids uh, or grandkids, marrying off your last kid, becoming an empty nester, retiring. Uh, those are things that we would say um, are moments for that really, I, in my view, should require some measure of recalibration. If you're thinking clearly, you're going to as assess, what did this mean to me? How do I envision? This. And there are some ways in which uh, one can do that, and we have a little kit in this that I'm, I'm going to be giving to you um, when the book comes out. But that said, there are also involuntary things, things you did not plan, and you well know about those. Uh, suffering a major setback, a disabling accident, or a life-changing health institute, incident, incident, or being close to someone who has, getting a divorce, emerging from an abusive relationship or other trauma, transitioning from military to civilian life, losing your job or facing some other career setback or disappointment, losing a loved one such as a parent, a spouse, a child, a sibling, getting notice from your company that you're being forced to retire, becoming a full-time caregiver to an ailing spouse or family member. These are uh, life events that force us to, or should invite us, whether we like it or not, our response needs to be an upward view, an inward view, a backward view, a forward view, which I'll describe in just a minute. So living with an eternal perspective is more than head knowledge. And so I argue that it's anchored in the wisdom and truth that God uses to transform us from the inside out. And so viewing our lives in relationship to eternity, these experiences that occur in your life invite you, if you're listening carefully, what do I do? Let me revisit. Where, what are my values? Where, where did I come from? Where am I heading? So you, you, you always you need to keep that because you see, if you are on a, a vessel and you are in a small boat, um, you need to constantly change because a one degree off now would be my, many, ma many miles amplified as if you continue in that wrong course. So you constantly, you find that they're always moving, always changing it because of that nature. So, so it is with our lives. So align our thoughts. Our, how do I align my affections and thoughts with that which God calls valuable? Because indeed, the, mo the wisest thing you can do is to treat things according to their true value. The dumbest thing you can do then is to treat the things that are worthless as if they were valuable. In other words, toys, tinsel, and trinkets, and suddenly try to make that what you want. Isn't that, hasn't that happened sometimes that God has to pry your fingers open one at a time, to t and you're holding so cling clinging so tightly to this thing? It's got to be it's everything I've got. It's all I have. And then finally... In that painful process, the last finger is open, and then you see what it was. It was a bit of tin foil that you were clinging to. He says, now keep your hand open. I'm going to get, replace that, what you thought was life, because you don't know, know what life, I know what life's about, and you have your illusion that you know what's best. I'm going to take that out. I'm going to give you a diamond, the diamond of my grace. Don't cling too tightly to it, though, you see. It's all of great gift and grace, always dependent on me. And so this is his desire. He's not the enemy of our joy. So I have to align my affections and thoughts with what he defines to be important. So the measure, the, the value of a thing is what God tells it to be. And, that's how, and how do we dis discover that? Because he's revealed himself, his desires for us in the scriptures. And so as we recalibrate, naturally we have to have an eternal perspective in this temporal arena in which we are invited to revisit the word of God and to review that. So set our hope on that which endures and channel our actions and motivation. You've got a unique purposes and opportunities that you need to reflect on and ask the Spirit of God, and as you, re as you read uh, the Scriptures, um, to prompt you and, and uh, help you grasp where you are. So these are processes that are inv inviting us to get the larger perspective. Um, so these are some of the questions that we've, that we've listed here that I wanted to give you as well, just again in anticipation. Does the work I do every day really matter? For what purpose am I storing up all these earthly possessions? Should I be giving more to God and his purposes? Am I using my time well, or am I spending too much of it on frivolous pursuits? Or should I be serving others more instead? Am I prioritizing time with family and others I love, or putting them off, presuming I can always make it up later? 
Because what will often happen then is that uh, you suppose that the future will make up for your present lack. And then it never occurs. And am I ready to die, you see? Or have I, do I have unfinished business? And as long as we're alive, we've got some unfinished business. We're, and really, in a technical sense, we're all, as I say, on borrowed time. Me, with my crazy numbers of, of near-death experiences, I know I'm on borrowed time. I, I must be a little dumb that way, because I need lots of reminders more than other people that you're mortal. I thought I knew that, but then, whoop, well, here's another. So, um, but I do realize that every time it's happened, it's a reminder and it's a teaching incident that actually gives me another insight that I didn't have before. So it's like a God's way of teaching me, I suppose. I don't know why. But um, my, is there unfinished business? And then multiple occasions of that nature, I, I realized as, my reflect, as I did reflect on my whole, the entire way of my life, there's something unfinished. And so I knew this wasn't the time. That happened the first time when I was on the Sea of Galilee, about to drown. <laughs> that would have been a very dramatic uh, death. In the, oh, what a man of God. <laughs> After all, he died on the Sea of Galilee. Um, but uh, it was not meant to be. And I knew that when that happened, because I couldn't get a purchase, uh, I, on, I couldn't move. I was uh, about a tenth of a mile off the uh, shore. And uh, I couldn't go. To, a storm came in violently. And uh, you just, it's, it's like a saucer. It, just, uh, it goes in from the funnel on the, we on the west and amplifies. And it was, I couldn't get, move forward. And I'm totally out of energy. And I see in the distance the shore, I can't get closer. And I'm beginning to lose my energy. And that's when I process this. And he said, you're, 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 there's unfinished business. Next thing I knew, I was on the shore. I mean, just there. I don't know how. And then I couldn't get a purchase because it was all slippery. But the next thing I knew, I was on the top. And then I got the chance to reflect. You see, that's a way of getting your attention. Well, God's trying to prompt and give us all attention because we need to know that as long as you're here, he has a purpose for you. Is it possible to face aging, sickness, and death without fear so that they don't haunt me? So questions of this nature here. And so one of the, uh, we have a number of tools, about 18 different tools that are part of this, like a kit. And one of those is um, a, a rooting your identity in Christ because we have to see then who and whose we are. Again, in any kind of assessment of this world, we have to say, who am I in this world? And again, the fundamental questions, what are they? They're the questions of identity, the questions of purpose, and the question of hope. And so what is the, what, what is the matter of the question of, of identity? So when you're, when you're considering identity, Who am I? Who defines me? Who are you? Are you what the world defines your, 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 you to be? Or are you what the, what the, what the word defines you to be? And then um, purpose. Why am I here? And then hope. So this relates to these three questions that are so critical. In other words, it, it, it's, it's who am I? And that's a fundamental question. Why am I here? And that's another fundamental question, which most people never ask. And what's the third one? You tell me. Yeah, where am I going? And so I think these are fundamental things that we need to assess. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? The identity, purpose, and hope. And that's really part of what we're doing in this, in this component here. What is my identity? And allowing God to, re to redefine us is the whole idea. Now, we are mentioned, and this is very important to note, without God, if you do recalibration, it's an exercise in futility. It'd, be, it'd just be another self-improvement schedule scheme, you see. Every day and in every way, I'm getting better and better, this sort of positive thinking. But no, with him, it's more than self-help. And so here's the kinds of things we're looking at. Um, Therefore, my beloved, Philippians 2, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to work and willing to work and for his good pleasure, which he means that it's God, it's your outworking of his in working. And so um, it's connection. And then not being conformed, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Or in Hebrews 12, that we are laying aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the wisdom of that, not looking at the other runners. 
because comparison is the enemy of contentment. And so you look at him, where would you have me to be? And keeping my eye, my, my, uh, my eye on him and looking at the, uh, at the end with, in, with that in mind. Uh, forgetting what lies behind, Paul says in Philippians 3, and looking forward to what lies ahead instead of being defined by the past. I can look at it, but I don't want to stare at it. I want to be defined by, by the unbounded joy and glory of the future because that past is no longer going to define me. It's, it's got pain and sorrow and joys as well. But your true, true uh, destiny is what defines you. And God even leverages that pain and transmutes it into the, into the uh, glory of God, into his, into his goodness, so that even that will be transformed. So um, this idea of forgetting what lies behind, straight, straining forward, like pressing on to the goal, looking not at the things that are seen, uh, but the things that are unseen. Because the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And so anchoring yourself in something that never changes in the midst of world and people and situations in which it's always changing. We also discussed the role of suffering in this. And of course, again, this is just brief overview. We're all in, a, in this journey together where he often strips away the temporal things. Because if you had everything the way you wanted it, when you wanted it and how much and how, you would be ruined, you see. And, you, and many people think of God as a kind of a cosmic slot machine anywhere, not a slot machine, but a, a, a vending machine. And you put in the, the right money and push the right buttons, and this is the outcome. And then when it doesn't work out the way they want, suddenly he's, they can't trust him anymore, which is a horrendous thing. Remember this principle in your life that you are not to evaluate your uh, changing uh, God in light of your changing circumstances. Otherwise, you're on a roller coaster. He's wonderful, and he's a wonderful God when things are going well, but all of a sudden, you know, can, how can I trust him now when things are falling apart? No, the mistake there was that you are always to view your changing circumstances in light of his unchanging character. And that's what gives you an anchor for your soul, stability and hope. So it's really not the pain that occurs to us, but how do we respond to it? And pain will either make you better or bitter. That's your choice. But you, if it's significant enough, you'll not be the same person again. And you're, you're shaped by your responses to your pain because none of us escapes without pain. Jesus said, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We know this is part of it. And he says, if they, te if they hated me, they'll hate you. And so there is a growing mindset. But at the same time, we realize that we are in God's care, his providential care. And greater is he who is in you than he was in the world. And so we are more than victors because we see the best is yet to come and he's overcome the world. And that's a mindset that, uh, but these things can jolt us out of our routines, sometimes very healthy. This was a recent thought that we had here. I, I kind of began to think about two kinds of, of, uh, of kairos, uh, of, of calibration. One is a kairos recalibration. Remember, we've, we've talked about this before, the idea of, of, of uh, Kronos and Kairos. And so when we, uh, here, when you're looking at calendar time, on the one hand, versus chirotic time, opportunity time. And so you, this is what you put in your planner. You can't, you can't put Kairos in there, but you can put it in your planner. And this is what you do. You make your, hold your plans before God. Hold them with a loose grip, though, because what's going to happen this, this day, and it'll happen multiple times more than you know, is God's going to give you little opportunities and he's going to mess up with your schedule a little bit here and there and see how things work. In other words, that's opportunity time. And those opportunity times that God invites you to pursue are actually perceived by us as interruptions or actually invitations, depending on how we respond. But the point is that there are two different ways. Some things we plan, some things we don't. So that made me think about this whole idea then of the concept of two kinds of recalibration. One is kairos, that happens when unusual things are, you interrupt our schedule. And the other is chronos, where you actually plan the recalibration. I hope that makes sense to you. So chronos recalibration, something you schedule into your calendar. One of, the, one of the best things you could do is to make sure you plan this on your decade birthdays. 
You should be doing it every birthday, by the way. It's, it's an invitation for you to re recalibrate. Just think of a birthday as a, record, as a reminder from God. Let's, re let's review the past, which has gone by so quickly, and reflect on the present, and then consider where am I heading in the future. So do, but the big birthdays, the, five, the O ones you see, 3 0, 4 0, 5 0, 6 0, 7 0, you, those wouldn't get your attention even more as you recognize, because your perception of time continues to be such that it goes faster and faster as we get older. Uh, there can be daily or micro, uh, monthly basis, midi, uh, macro basis, uh, annual. And so these are course corrections, and that's what we're talking about here. Again, we'll be discussing that more. Uh, the idea of the need for course corrections. And you, the point here is that the heart of recalibration is wanting your lives to matter. And that's really a God-given desire, isn't it? Nobody wants to live a life of irrelevance, of futility, of no sense. Did, is, did, did my life matter? Was there a reason for it? Best film I know to kind of illustrate what life would be like if you did not exist. Which one do you think of? It's a very popular film. It's a wonderful life. And, and so um, the whole, George Bailey gets a chance to see what others do not see. He felt that everything was going wrong in, this, in the whole, whole thing, that uh, the forces of evil are getting worse. So he has a chance to see what the life would have been like if he hadn't been there. And suddenly, it's a horrendous hell on earth. He sees, um, no, it's a bit, there's, yes, there's a bit, Frank Capra directed it, and sometimes uh, he's known for his Capricorn, you see, because a little corny here and there. But at the same time, you get the, you get the gist here, uh, that he discovers, it really, you, George really did leave a, a wonderful life. And look at what would have happened if this didn't happen, if this decision, this... Uh, no. And often, it was a life in which he actually voluntarily sacrificed his future and possibilities to help his brother and to, ser to serve other people. Where did that go? What about me? There's a scene in which he actually uh, blows up because another disappointment takes place, and he was planning to be an architect and create great things, and he tears it all up because it seems there's no, and in this despair, when everything seems to have gone wrong, that's when God gets his attention, is the, is the theme. I love to teach that film. Um, at the, at, so it's a deep desire for your life to matter. And um, none of us, of course, Psalm 90 is guaranteed another day. Teach us to number our days that we may what? And you remember the rest of it? We may present to thee a heart of wisdom. So he's telling us, if you do not, Assess your days and recognize the brevity of this earthly sojourn, that you're a pilgrim and a stranger and a wayfarer. If you don't grasp that, you will treat the temporal as if it's eternal, and you'll live like a fool. Instead, you need to transfer your affections to that which is coming. And so as the more we do this, the more we begin to imagine what that's going to be like and to see that. Then we live wisely. Otherwise, we'll become presumptuous. Come now, you who say, let's, let's start a business. Let's spend a year to get there and let's um, engage in business. And instead, you don't know even what your life is like. Your life is a vapor. You should, instead, you should say, if I live, we shall also do this or that. How do you know you're going to be around a year from now? So wisdom invites you to live more or less as if you have, this is your last year. If you were to buy into the idea that this would be your last year, you can pick a date. You can make the beginning of the year such a date if you wish. Suppose you lived that way, but then planned as if it's not. You see the difference there? So you're now living as if it really is the last year, and you imagine what it would be like. For, this is the world's last night for you. And then suddenly you're alive the next day, then you have another year. But it was a wise thing to do. So do not be presumptuous. Um, so this is an important wisdom in that. And again, our character and legacy build over time through the accumulation of many little decisions. Remember that phrase, so a, so an act, uh, an act, uh, so a thought reap, reap an action? So an action reap a habit? So a, a habit reap a character? So a character reap a destiny. 
The little cho choices matter. Your life is a tapestry that's woven out of the fine threads of day-by-day -day decisions, and the little decisions amass and accumulate and define us after a while so that we begin to have a, a kind of a way of becoming and being. And if we're not ca careful, it'll happen to us by default. But if we're really wise, we will revisit this before God and process this. And that's why we actually have this whole idea of what it means to finish well. And we have, let me just jump ahead here, we have a, 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 a process, is an, an annual chronos recalibration which is a, a, a very healthy thing to do. And we're, we're creating this, we're gonna turn this into a little booklet as well. It'd be rather useful. You could do it annually or you could do it anytime and make a shorter version where you prepare for this one day, half day, whatever. And um, in that you take, first of all, the backward look and you review the events of your life and uh, see how the story God's writing into your life and every part of it, job, events, relate, hard, uh, hardship, setbacks, take those in as well. How can he use them? So you, you kind of, one way you could do it is looking at your life in five or 10 year increments. So we have some specifics there. That's the backward look. Then you take the upward look and you, in that, you spend time connecting with God through prayer. And we give some scriptures for that possibility. So then you apply that to the next book, which is inward. So it's the backward look, look reviewing where have I been? What's the history? And what are the things that God has done and, and so forth? What are the joys and the, and the hard, hardships? How did he get me through those things and so forth? So looking at the back, then you look upward to who he is and then inward. And in that inward look then, you do an honest self-assessment before yourself and God. And we give some specific things for that. And then there's the forward look, looking where are things heading? Because I want you to live in such a way that you act as if the best is yet to come because it is. The best really is yet to come. That's the forward look as well. And uh, that to me makes an enormous, enormous difference. So um, I say that it's a personal process. It's a hope-filled vision in which you truly believe, maybe not in this life, and in fact, in this life we have troubles, but we are living more and more, transferring our affections, and there are ways in which you can do this. You can actually process. So again, giving you some tools to set your mind on the things above, uh, to um, see yourself for who you really are as a child of God who's adopted into his, uh, into his household, who is forever secure because he's the one who, who pursued you and called you, made you a part of a, of a significant context, namely the body of Christ, so that we are now not just isolated, but we are connected together. There's an interdependency, that there is a, a collegiality, that there is a communion of saints that we can participate in, and this is only the beginning of, of what's going to happen in a richer way. So understanding then that life has its pains and its, its pleasures, its, its joys and its uh, setbacks. We know this, but we recognize as well that regardless of um, what I often call the morbidity of decrepitude or the diminishment of our capacities or however we're going to be putting that, regardless of that, the best is yet to come because we look not at the things which are seen, but how? The things that are unseen. We now already are training ourselves to see, set our mind on the things above. We're right now, even now, God declares you perfect, holy, righteous, complete. Nothing to prove, no one to impress. The more you allow that to define us, then we can live in this world with poise, with peace, with purpose, with patience, and have a sense of other-centeredness because the more secure we are, what does that empower us to be? Servants of others. You gotta be secure before you can serve others. Everyone wants to be called a servant, but no one wants to be treated that way. What happens when people take you for granted? You still do it as unto the Lord, you see, and you do it because you're playing to an invisible audience of one. And that is a hope-filled vision in which the best is yet to come because I assure you it will. And it will be more than you could have imagined. Your only thing that you will regret then is the time that you didn't trust him enough to do what he called you to do in this little earth. Uh, so it's an accountability, and I think this is a very good idea as well. We were talking about this. And I think, yeah, Jenny, you're here. My co-author is right here, Jenny Abel. So I just noticed back there. So we had the idea of a, an accountability partner. You ought to be doing this. Um, <laughs> Um, I think it's a very healthy thing for you. What about having a partner 
you help me process this, and I'll help you process that. Then you see you're accountable, and, and you encourage each other and stimulate one another to love and good deeds, which I think is a rather good idea. Because you see, I want to be like this Psalm 92, um, Psalm 92, verses 13 and 14. And I want you to be like that, whether you're young or old or in any time in your, in your life. Psalm 92 um, can capture this for you. Um, it's, it, it says that, the, that the, the righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. It's a beautiful image, the cedar planted in God's temple, you see in, in, the, in the imagery of the, of, the, of the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield fruit in old age. They will be full of sap and very green. This is the good kind of sap. It's not when Rodney Dangerfield said, I looked up the family tree and I found out I was the sap. And that's not what he means. No, this is the, the sap is not that. But full sap, of course, is the vitality of the, of the plant itself. It still flows, you see, because you're abiding in Christ. And so whether even though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is, is forever young, you see. And they shall be full of sap and very, to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there's no unrighteousness in him. So this is a beautiful um, way of, of looking at, at, at this, at, at this uh, at our, at our earthbound life. And um, I just wanted to share that with you. So this is, um, this uh, basically is something that I'm going to be teaching you sometime. But I want you to even now think about what gives meaning to your life, you see, and the, and the basic questions of identity, purpose, and hope. What is your direction? And how do you want to wisely invest your life? And so, Actually, of course, the best thing you can do is to be a student of the Word of God and pursue Him and to know Him and to love Him. And so I ask people to pray for the grace of holy desire, you see, to want Him more than anything else. And sometimes uh, when you think about it, can you, can you honestly say you want Him and to become like Him more than any other good? And if you can't say, I really want to know Him or become like Him, want to know you more than any other thing. You can say this, do you want to want him more than anything else? That you can do. So you give him the, the loaves and fish and that he can multiply because he won't multiply nothing. So you want to do that? And, the, and I think even the desire to be pleasing to him is itself pleasing to him. So pray for that grace of holy desire and apprehension. We're out of time, but um, let me just uh, commit this uh, to you for your prayer and consideration. And even now, without the book, you can do this. You get, the, you get the gist of allowing God to define you and making space and time so that the Spirit of God, you can listen to his quiet voice and respond to it. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise that you pursue us and woo us and love us and romance us into an intimate context in which we can know you and become like you. And you've invited us to significance, to security, and to satisfaction so that we, our lives will matter. And we commit and commend our future, our families, our hopes, our dreams, our desires. We commend them into your good and uh, faithful care so that we move from anxiety to peace as we give all things to you and walk in your grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.